Well, good evening and welcome to the iJacapo webinar series. My name is Evan Jacobson and I'm the Director of Information Technology for the International Joint Commission on Allied Health Personnel in Ophthalmology. Each month, iJacapo hosts several continuing education webinars. The iJacapo webinars feature leading ophthalmologists, ophthalmic medical technicians, and professionals presenting on current topics in eye care. We want to remind everyone that our presenters generously volunteer to share their time and expertise to help us bring high quality educational opportunities for you to gain knowledge, earn continuing education credits, and help you advance in your ophthalmic careers. For the certified ophthalmic medical technicians in tonight's audience, you can earn one iJacapo Group A continuing education credit by viewing this webinar and passing the post-webinar quiz with a score of 80% or higher. You will have through Tuesday, June 11th, to view the recorded webinar and complete the quiz for CE credit. Our presenters will be reviewing and responding to questions in our Q&A forum. So if you have any questions about this topic, we encourage you to submit them there. The Q&A forum, by the way, can be found below the link to this recording. Now, tonight's webinar is titled, Where Hallucinations and Illusions Live in the Brain, and is presented by Srav Vigunta, MD, and Bradley Jacobson, MD. Nice going on the last name there, Bradley, by the way. That's, that's great. Not many Jacobsons around. All right, Dr. Srav Vagunta is currently a resident physician at the Moran Eye Center. She received her medical degree from the University of Arizona College of Medicine and is interested in neuro-ophthalmology. Dr. Bradley Jacobson is also an ophthalmology resident at the Moran Eye Center. He received his medical degree from the University of California, Irvine School of Medicine, and is published in several journals, including the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine, and BMC Ophthalmology. And now I am pleased to introduce to you Dr. Srav Agunta and Bradley Jacobson. Take it away, guys. Awesome. Thanks for the great introduction, Evan. We're really happy to be doing this. Um, just to state, we have uh, no financial uh, interests or disclosures. And uh, so we're actually going to start off with a case. Um, and I want you all to um, just remember this case. We're not going to go through the whole thing right now, but um, we're going to kind of go through the presentations and the symptoms, and then we'll come back to the case at the very end of uh, the presentation. And so moving on to the next slide here. Um, so, Ms. Smith, my name is uh, Dr. Jacobson. Uh, what brings you in today? Hi, Dr. Jacobson. Um, I came in because my doctor in the ICU said I should have an eye exam. Oh, okay, great. Well, why don't you tell me, do you, do you know why your doctor sent you here, the doctor from the ICU? What, what, what brought you to the ICU? Well, I'm just 36 years old, but I actually had a heart attack. I went into the hospital because I was having chest pain, and they diagnosed me with a heart attack. Uh, they took me to the heart catheterization lab, and the interventional radiologist was trying to put in a stent, and while they were, they were trying to do that, they ended up dissecting several of my arteries, and I ended up bleeding out. So I had to have transfusions of a lot of blood and platelets, and I was awake during part of the procedure, but I remember passing out, and next thing I know, it was this... Okay, Ms. Smith, so th this is all great information, but I am an eye doctor. Um, I, I mean, as much as I would love to hear all of this, why don't you tell me about your visual complaints? So, so I'm getting to that. Well, I remember waking up in the ICU and, and just having difficulty seeing. Like, I, I could see what was in front of me. I could read some words, but I just kept getting startled when people would walk into the room. So, for example, um, my, my ICU doctor, she came into the room and, and was talking to me. Then all of a sudden, I saw this other man in the room and who was her uh, resident. And apparently, he was in the room the whole time, but I was very startled because I didn't see him walk in with her. So, was it, was it that you weren't able to see the resident physician, or was he blurred out? Was it, he blacked out, or was he just completely invisible until he started talking? Uh, when I finally looked over, I, I could see him 
his face clearly. It's just that I didn't realize he was in the room at first. I only saw one person. And this keeps happening to me. I, I keep like ha- being startled by other people in the room when I think there's only one other person there with me. Huh, very interesting. Well, let's move on to um, your exam. So it um, looks like here your visual acuity is 20-20 in your right eye and left eye, which is perfect vision. Um, your visual fields are full, um, but it looks like you did have um, a hard time, um, you know, localizing and actually saying that, you know, you see the number three or number four, but you still perform perfectly on it. Your pupils were equally round and reactive to light with no um, afferent pupillary defect. Um, and your extraocular movements also were intact. However, it, it did take you quite a bit of time to move your eyes in the different directions I was uh, asking you to move. Um, and then when performing the finger to nose uh, test, it looks like you were able to um, really localize your nose very easily. But when you were reaching out for the objects, it looked like it was pretty difficult for you to actually touch the object. So I think we need to do a little more testing. So what I want to do next is I'm going to put up this screen and I want you to describe to me what you see. Um, well, on, on the screen, I see a T. I think there's, oh, there's another T next to it. Mm-hmm. Anything that the T's are making up right now? What, what, what shape are the T's making? Well, I'm not sure what you mean. I see it. I see me. Oh, I see another T. I see three T's. Okay. All right. Well, let's move on to this next screen. Um, and that actually formed an H, Miss Smith, just to let you know. Um, so I want you to tell me what, describe this picture to me. What do you see? Well, in this picture, I see a lady. And she just looks like she's washing a dish, a lady washing a dish. And do you see anything more than that? Anything more in the picture? Uh, She's standing next to a sink. How many people do you see in the picture? Uh, I don't know what you mean. I just see the one lady. Okay, so there's actually three people in this picture. All right, guys, so uh, thanks for listening to that. So like I said, just kind of keep that in mind throughout this presentation, and uh, now we're going to move on to some content. I'd like to start off with uh, defining the difference between hallucinations and illusions. So hallucinations are uh, conditions where there is no true sensory stimulus, but the visual cortex perceives a stimulus. So there isn't, for example, light in, in our vision, but our visual cortex thinks there is light. Whereas in in an illusion, there is a true sensory stimulus, but the the brain misinterprets it. So there's a visual stimulus, like an object, but the brain misinterprets it as something else than it actually is. And we'll go through some examples of this. So we're going to start off with uh, hallucinations um, stimulated by the eye. And to start off, we're going to talk about photopsias. So Essentially, a photopsia is um, flashing light scene, um, and we often see this, uh, for those of you that work in the retina clinic, um, you'll, we always ask our patients, do you see any flashing lights? Um, and what this is, is essentially the photoreceptors in our eyes are getting stimulated, but not by light like they normally or how they're made to be stimulated. They're actually getting stimulated by a, a mechanical pressure which then sends a stimulus to the brain, and that's what the brain perceives as light. Um, And, uh, you know, in retina detachments, for example, uh, this is a vitreous pulling on the retina. Um, And then on the next slide here, we see uh, pressure phosphines, and this is a different type of mechanical stimulus. So definitely don't recommend doing this, but maybe as a kid, when you close your eyes and you press on your eyeball, you would actually see these flashing lights. And once again, this is another example of a hallucination. So it's it's not there, it's not present, but your brain is perceiving these flashing lights. Um, Now, I want you guys to stop pressing your eye because I'm sure some of you are trying this out right now. Um, And now we're gonna move on to illusions. So illusions, again, um, are conditions where there is a true sensory stimulus, but the brain misinterprets it. So there is, for example, a light stimulus that exists, it's real, but our brain uh, misinterprets it as something else. An example of uh, illusions include entopic phenomena, and we'll give you some examples of this. 
So the first one I want to talk about is uh, shear phenomenon. So basically what this is, is um, when we see moving stars or small lights, especially when looking at a bright field of snow or blue sky, uh, we're actually perceiving white blood cells traveling in the retinal capillaries. And so um, oftentimes, especially here in Utah, um, people will be, you know, going down the slope skiing or snowboarding. And they'll come in and they'll say, I saw these black dots in the snow. But really, like I just said, it's just the white blood cells traveling through the retina. So these these uh, visual stimuli are actually present. The, the, the body, is, the brain is not perceiving anything that's not present, like uh, a hallucination. So again, entropic phenomena occur when there is a true uh, stimulus within one's own eye, but it can't be shared with another person. So only you can see it, but someone else can't see it, but it's still real. Um, another example of this that we see in the ophthalmology clinic is called a Purkinje tree. When you're examining a patient at the slit lamp, for example, they might say, Whoa, I can see my veins. Right. And that happens to everybody. So it's not that special. But it's when a bright light is shined in the eye and the patient can see their own vessels and the outline of the vessels, especially when they're looking far up or far down. We have some examples of other types of illusions. Um, xanthopsia is another example of an illusion. And this, is, this occurs when we see um, yellow. So xantho means yellow. So images appear yellow in our vision, even though they're truly just their normal color. Um, this can happen when patients have cataracts or due to drug toxicity, such as digoxin, which is a heart medication. As you can see on the image back, on the left, the um, image looks more yellow, whereas the image on the right looks normal. Another example of this um, in art history is uh, Xanthopsia and Van Gogh's yellow palette. So there have been many studies that have been uh, reported studying um, Van Gogh's yellow palette. So he, uh, his images used to have a lot of yellow colors in them, and people thought that this was due to his episodes of malnutrition, substance abuse, environmental exposures, or drug experimentation. They thought that he had taken digitalis, and that digitalis, which is the um, flower that is used to make the jocks and the heart medication, and this caused his vision to become yellow. Um, however, that actually panned out to not be true because he used yellow even when he was um, completely healthy. And it's likely that he was just following the trends of the time and he needed, uh, he just wanted to try out a yellow palette. And then the next thing we want to talk about is uh, something called metamorphopsia. So essentially what this is, is uh, this is when objects appear thinner, fatter, shorter, longer than they actually are. Um, and so oftentimes in retina clinic, what we'll do is we'll uh, provide someone with something called an Amsler grid um, when we're looking for transition from dry to wet macular degeneration. And we have the patients test one eye at a time. And essentially what we're looking for is metamorphopsia. Looking at those straight lines, we ask them, are there, is there any distortion, any waviness? Do they appear shorter or larger than they actually are? Another interesting example um, is Alice in Wonderland syndrome, where patients can have micropsia or macropsia. Micropsia is where images seem smaller than they are, and macropsia is where images seem larger than they are, as they did for Alice in Wonderland. So the causes of this um, include uh, damage to the frontotemporal part of our brain. Um, this can be due to migraines, encephalitis, uh, which is an infection of the brain caused by, most commonly, Epstein-Barr virus, which is the same bar virus that can cause mono, um, or even epilepsy or seizures. So um, I found a very interesting testimonial of a patient who reported um, what she experienced when she had Alice in Wonderland syndrome growing up. So I'm going to read her testimonial to you. It always starts the same way. I'm lying in bed, drifting off to sleep, and suddenly everything starts to feel fast, frantic, and there's an accompanying feeling of dread. As the feeling builds, the walls start to shrink. Shrink in and all sense of perception goes right out the window, like I'm inside a massive telescope. My limbs feel out of proportion with my body and my tongue feels too large for my mouth, and it's all happening inside my head. So she talks about in this, in this testimonial that she used to have these episodes um, just randomly and more commonly when she was a child, and they'd often be followed by headaches or migraines. Um, she had a whole workup. She had head imaging done. 
and had met with neurologists throughout her childhood, and there was no specific um, cause for her condition. She didn't have seizures either. And as she grew older into adulthood, the uh, frequency of the episodes decreased over time, thankfully. Um, there are also other conditions called Alice in Wonderland-like phenomenon. So this includes Lilliputianism, which is interesting. Uh, patients see others as small people. There's also a, a hallucination version of this. So whereas Alice in Wonderland syndrome is an, is an illusion, um, Lilliputian hallucinations are, as you can see in this picture, um, the patients see lots of little people who are not actually there, which can be quite alarming. The causes of these include migraine, seizures, um, but also schizophrenia or drug abuse, including cough syrup. Okay, so we're going to move on now to something called higher order cortical visual loss. And essentially what this is, is this is visual loss that is caused by abnormalities in the brain. There's nothing the matter with the actual eye, but the insult has actually occurred in the brain. Um, and to start this off, um, I want to show you all a video that uh, was put out by NPR. It's called The Blind Woman Who Sees Rain, But Not Her Daughter's Smile. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and play that for you. And just so you know, um, the lady in this video does have a very, very strong Scottish accent. Um, you'll get used to it after a couple of seconds, but uh, we'll come back after this video. The last thing I remember is lying here in my own bed. And I, I vaguely remember being taken to the hospital. And then after that, I, I don't remember anything. When I woke up, it was completely black. Absolutely black. When Melina Channing was 29 years old, she was left blind by a stroke. My eyes are perfect, but it's the damage that the stroke did to my brain. It had completely decimated her primary visual cortex, that area at the back of the brain that processes all the information from your eyes. But then, a little while later... I was giving Stephanie a bath and, you know, running the tap, running the water. I see the water moving. But... Then they went and told all the doctors. They said um, it's, it's her imagination. And then I started seeing um, the rain coming down from the sky, the windscreen wipers on, the steam coming from my coffee cup. And though she couldn't see her daughter? I would see her ponytail moving left to right. It seemed to be things that were moving, but nobody believed me. She visited neurologists in Canada who showed her this weird shifting grid. I actually started crying because I could see it. It turns out there are these modules in the brain that are specialized for processing higher order aspects of vision, like recognizing faces or letters or motion. And it seemed that in Melina's brain, the information coming through the eyes had found a way to bypass that broken primary visual cortex and still get out to that motion module, a part of her brain that was apparently still intact. It's just amazing what I can see. I can avoid obstacles and fill the kettle. I'm seeing colors better, but I can't see people. I don't see your face. I mean, you're there, but I just see the shadow. That compartmental nature of vision that may have been her blessing is also proving to be a quiet curse. Just now and again, it hits me, you know, why can't I see my daughter's face and who does she look like? And it's so frustrating. And then I think about it for a while and then I think, oh, well... At least I'm here.
All right, so we'll move on to the next slide here. So what this video is essentially presenting is some, something called the Riddock phenomenon. And what this lady had in this video was essentially destruction of her primary visual cortex. So this is where the majority of our vision is processed. But she had this residual conscious visual function um, with the ability to perceive motion. So she wasn't able to see things that were stationary, but the minute they started moving, she was able to see that. And as you guys can see, let me get um, our arrow here. So there are two different pathways. There's the V5 pathway, which is the dorsal pathway. And this is responsible for the wear of our vision. So essentially motion. And then over here, we have the V4 pathway. This is the ventral pathway. Um, and that deals with more of the what of our vision. And then the V1, 2, and 3 that you see towards the back, this is the primary visual cortex. And that, that's what was essentially um, destroyed in this lady in this video. And because of this preservation um, of the retinotectopulvinar pathway to V5, she was still able uh, to see her daughter moving, to see steam, to see water pulling in the cup. Great. What? I know. That can be kind of confusing. So we're going to go over this a few more times just to make sure we learn it really well. So essentially, um, neuroanatomists divided the brain into several different regions, especially the cortical areas of our brain, into regions called Broadman areas. And then we've also subdivided them into V1, V2, and so on. So these, the primary visual cortex in our brain, as you saw in the previous image, is, uh, consists of V1, V2, and V3. And this area relays information that we receive from our eyes um, to other parts of our, of our brain. And that includes the V4 and V5 regions. So essentially, those regions help interpret the data. So raw data uh, and, and light arrives from our eyes to the primary visual cortex, the V1, V2, and V3 regions. And I'm going to go to the next slide to show you the picture again. And that information is just raw data that is then sent to the V5 and V4 regions to help us interpret what we're seeing. So to help interpret where an image is in space, we have the V5 area. And then to help interpret what an image is, such as identifying an object or a face, we have the V4 area. So we call the V4 area the where stream or the dorsal stream. Again, this helps with our spatial processing, identifying where an object is in space, its location, um, whether it's moving, whether it changes shape, and its relationship to other structures around it. Um, and then the ventral stream or the V4 area helps with object processing. This helps us determine what the color of an object is, its texture, the details of a picture, its shape, and its size. So examples of disorders of recognition include problems with our uh, V4 area. So object agnosia, prosep agnosia. Um, object agnosia is when we have trouble identifying what an object is. Prosep agnosia is when we have trouble identifying faces. Topographic nausea is difficult identifying locations. And then cerebral achromatopsia has to do with difficult identifying colors. So color vision problems can not only originate in the optic nerve or our retina, but they can also be directly related to a defect in our brain's cortex. So here's another case that I want to share with you guys that um, talks about um, this uh, inability to recognize objects. Um, and faces. So a 41-year-old man awakes one day feeling like there is something wrong with his vision. He says, it's all just wrong. He has difficulty recognizing faces and has to rely on the clothes that people are wearing, their voices or hairstyle. He no longer sees any colors, describing the world as a dirty black and white picture. He feels like skin tones are especially grotesque to him. Over time, he has been able to start seeing some colors, but finds it hard to distinguish colors that are similar to each other. For example, blue and green. He now gets lost a lot in his neighborhood, which he thinks is because all the buildings and cars look the same. And so 
what you see in this uh, picture right here is something called prosopagnosia, which is what uh, Sarav was just talking about. And so it's the inability to recognize people's faces. And this is essentially how they see their world, except even worse, he also had uh, achromatopsia and he wasn't able to distinguish between different colors. And so um, this is, I think, a great picture displaying just what somebody with this disorder um, might be seeing in their world. All right, so after all of that, let's get back to our first patient. Um, so in summary, this is a 36-year-old woman. Remember, after the long story she told me, she essentially, she had a heart attack, um, she had a uh, catheterization to try to unblock those arteries that were clogged. And essentially, um, a complication was a uh, dissection of the coronary arteries. So she had major bleeding, which uh, essentially led to an ischemic stroke. So when she came in and saw me, her vision was 20-20 in both her eyes. She had full visual fields, although if you do remember, she did have a difficult time, meaning it just took her longer than usual. Um, and then she also had full extraocular movements, although once again, she had difficulty initiating those eye movements. She eventually could look up, down, left, or right, but just initiating it was difficult for her. And then lastly, she had very difficult time finding objects. Um, and so that was represented really by that T picture we saw making the H um, and then also the finger to nose. So when she touched her nose and she reached out towards the object, it was really hard for her to find that object. So we have diagnosed her now with balance syndrome. And she's, she fits this diagnosis perfectly because she has all three findings that we see in this syndrome. Um, specifically, she has simultaneous nausea, ocular motor apraxia, and ocular ataxia. And we're going to break each of these down and talk about what they are. Okay, so to start off, simultaneous nausea. And so this is the failure of the ability to pay attention to more than one object at a time. So as you recall, I showed her this top picture, the T's that make an H. She was able to identify the individual T's, but she could not, she could not express that these T's actually made an H shape. And then um, this picture that you see of the lady washing dishes and the cookie jar, it's classically referred to as the cookie jar thief uh, picture. So she could see the woman washing the dishes, but she wasn't also able to tell me about the kid on the stool stealing the cookies or the window or the water overflowing. So people often view this as missing the force for the trees. Our patient also had ocular motor apraxia, which is a defect in the initiation and guidance of eye movements to visual targets. So she had full extraocular movements, but following a finger and following it smoothly across her vision was very difficult for her. It was easy for her to lose uh, where the finger was going, but it is also difficult for her to move her eyes to follow that image, as you can see in this picture. Finally, she also had optic ataxia, which is inaccurate reaching to visual targets. Um, so as you see in this image, uh, this gentleman on the top, in the top picture is reaching for the spoon that's held in front of him, but he keeps missing it. So he's reaching just below the spoon. And in the bottom picture, again, the spoon, he can see where it is. He can see where his hand is, but he cannot actually physically touch the spoon. So he's missing it each time. So this has to do with poor hand-eye coordination, essentially. Our patient had good finger-to-nose touching in terms of um, being able to touch her nose so she knew where her own um, body parts were in space, which is good proprioception. But when she was asked to touch an object in front of her or the examiner's finger in front of her, uh, she kept missing it and kind of overshooting or undershooting, essentially. So where is the lesion in the brain when someone has balance syndrome? The typical lesion um, is actually in the bilab bilateral occipitoparietal cortex. So as you can see in this picture all the way to the left, um, patients have uh, uh, lesions in the occipital regions, which are in the green here, and also in the yellow regions, the parietal lesions. And in the um, MRI pictures in the center uh, image and, and the image to the right, 
you can see there is a stroke here in the bilateral occipital parietal region. So causes of um, lesions in these areas are cerebrovascular disease, so again, stroke. So we see these in areas that are called watershed regions, so areas where there is a gap or um, uh, less blood supply due to two arteries meeting, essentially. Um, anoxic brain injuries can also cause this, so a lack of oxygen to the brain. This can be due to, for example, carbon monoxide poisoning. And we also see this in kutzfeld jakob disease, which is also known as mad cow. Another um, more common cause of balance syndrome is actually Alzheimer's disease, which is a neurodegenerative disorder. So um, a certain form of Alzheimer's disease called posterior cortical atrophy especially affects the occipitoparietal region. As you can see in the MRI pictures, again, um, the occipital regions here uh, have a lot of spaces. So you're actually seeing cerebrospinal fluid in the, in the darker black here and a loss of uh, brain volume, essentially. You can again see that in this image. So we'd like to thank you for your attention. And um, yeah, thank you guys all for uh, joining us. And uh, there is a form um, that uh, Evan talked about in the beginning that you can post any questions. We're more than happy to answer them um, when this goes live. And uh, just some pictures up here. This is our... Um, intern class, I guess, uh, to your left using the, the, uh, the different lenses. And then on the right-hand side is uh, all of us at our resident retreat. Um, we're a fun group here at Moran Eye Center. So if you guys are interested in opto or, you know, coming over here, just give us a call. Yep. And that's, uh, <laughs> that, that's me with the green arrow. <laughs> and we'd also like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Don Raphael Wynn, who is a former neuro-ophthalmology uh, fellow at the Moran Eye Center, and who also helped us with this presentation. Thanks again for your attention. Good luck on your guys' quiz. You'll do great. It's easy. <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, thank you so much, Dr. Bagunta and Dr. Jacobson. We'd like to thank all of you for attending this webinar presentation, and we remind you to successfully complete the quiz for CE credit. Now, to register for the next uh, IGCAPO Continuing Education webinar, please go to our events page by visiting our iCare Marketplace website at iCareMarketplace.org. Once there, click on the Webinars and Regional Events link. Finally, we rely on your feedback to help us provide engaging and high-quality online education. So we'd appreciate you taking a few moments to complete the webinar evaluation that accompanies your CE quiz. Again, thank you for joining us for the IGCAPA webinar, Where Hallucinations and Illusions Live in the Brain, presented by Dr. Srav Vagunta and Dr. Bradley Jacobson. Thanks, everyone, and have a good night.